And then, you know, what are our modeling techniques? You know, what, what are we using? Well, of course, the, the old drafting board. Uh, mathematical equations. I use a software called Mathematica. Anyone heard of that? So you, basically, you, you can get equations, standard equations, and you can just change them. So you have an equation, and you just change a number here, a number there, and it will change the output. You really don't have to understand mathematics. You can just play with the equation on a screen. And then you'll get, like these guys, these are equation-based. This, the one on the bottom right, that's SolidWorks. And the top left is scanning, laser scanning. And I was reading recently, they're scanning now these old historical temples in Thailand, creating detailed three-dimensional models. So your tools today, wow, you know, you could slap a piece of clay on a, on a tabletop and scan it. You could scan a tree, you could a snake, probably want it dead, but you could, you could scan a snake. Your start points now are huge. You have so many places to start creating form, exploring form. Um, what's the conceptual world you live in? Now, I'd argue that you, you're really in a rectangular conceptual world. We're sort of played by rectangles. This space, the trim of the posters, everything all around you, it's a rectangular world. And if you have been involved in mathematics, you'll find it's the same, X, Y, Z. It's an X, Y, Z rectangular universe. Uh, I call it like a Home Depot world. You know, it's e economical. Pick that window size because it's econ economical. I call it a trap. It's a development through time. And it's been very, very useful. But think about our technologies now. We don't have to be trapped in a rectangular world anymore. We have the technologies to create any shape. And it's moving that way. You know, we've been trapped into sort of injection molding, things like that, sheet pressing. But now we're getting in, they're bringing in into production lines, 3D or fusing machines. It's huge. I mean, you don't have to make 10,000 of a one unit. You can make five or 10,000. It's extraordinary. You guys are so lucky. I never had that. We had to pay like $10,000 for one piece of steel and manufacture from it. I wish I was, you, you know, sitting there right now with you guys. It's so much more fun. Anyway, streamlining. I figured that was a criteria for automotive design. Streamlining, shape, form. I have a problem with many architects. The design from the outside, how does it look? Is it cool looking? But do they really design inside? Do they really look at the human and our needs? and what will empower us, and make us feel good. I mean, it's light, it's color, it's shape. Do you really need to create in a rectangular box? I mean, there are a lot of efficiencies in a rectangular box, but there are other possibilities. So, streamlining is one. Natural history. I was quite intrigued by the fact that the head of this snake looks like a lot of contemporary car designs. I also thought I'd you know, share, you've probably seen them, but ideas that are coming through right now that represent today's challenges. Human population. I was born 1945. Earth population was about 2 billion. Today it's 7, roughly. By the end of the century, they're forecasting 11 or 12 billion. There are four times more people on this planet today than when I was your age. Huge. In every respect. Everything. Everything in your world is different to the way it was in mine. So this is neat. Have you seen this one on the top left? 
It's a really nice little concept. And then the other thing, given population density, particularly in urban areas, space. Anyone from Tokyo been to Tokyo? Micro hotels, capsule hotels. Anyone slept in one? Uh, <laughs> I won't ask. I'll talk to you later. Um, <laughs> but the experience, hell, it's going to be tricky. How do, you, how do you design small spaces that will empower people? Well, you've got OLEDs, organic light emitting diodes, flexible screens. You've got to think of color spectrum, so you've got to think of shape. God, you've got to think so many things, but it's going to happen. You know, you've got, oh, sorry, jumped too quick. But um, these are like sewer pipe hotels. And I put that little guy there, it's like Einstein with a idea bubble. Anyway, so go back in time. Now I've got my history hat on. Um, and it's just the way I am. But hopefully you're kind of similar. I'm very analytical. I'm watching. I'm looking, figuring out how things work. But here I am, not in a hardware store. I'm walking in the streets of old Cairo. It's a market area. It's kind of disgusting, really. I mean, it's dirty and people everywhere. And this window, though it's on the right, attracted my attention. It seemed different. It seemed to be dynamic. As I looked at the, the geometry of it, it seemed to move. I started thinking about it, wondering about it. You know, what does it mean? Why is it there? It's actually, the, the building is uh, Sarghatmich Sarg Mosque. That's the name of it. And I'll try not to say that again, because I can hardly pronounce it, but it's a school, and it dates back to the 14th century. And just for your FYI, the, at that time, the Abbasid uh, Caliphate was highly inspirational from about 600 tailing off at the time this was built, but full of inspiration, full of ideas, and then it sort of tailed away. So that window attracted my attention. And where I'm going to take you here is, OK, how I look, what I think about, and how then I try to develop it from history. So I did my research. And you probably can't see it too clearly from where you are. But I found that there was a guy called Jules Bourguin. And he was posted to the French consulate in Cairo and then in Baghdad. And he became obsessed with the geometries of that period, the Abbasid Caliphate, early Islamic period. He, he gets obsessed, and he writes this book, The Art of the Arab. And on page 161, I found that he'd interpreted the window. And this is important, because when each of you interpret something, you're going to have a different twist on the interpretation. None of you will be wrong just different. And that's the delight of it, is the difference. So he interpreted that window, the design of it, using what he called the ray method. So he subdivided space with symmetries of polygons. And he spread out those lines of symmetry, looking at where they intersected. And from those intersection points, he put rosettes. And this was all done, actually, within a square tile. A square can repeat. I don't see a square tile, but it can repeat. So he created this design within a square. He organized space that way. And that was his interpretation of that geometry. I looked at that window and interpreted it differently. I interpreted it in terms of circles, different, very different. And why did I do that? Well, my background, my disposition, I like circles. And I saw it this way, and it's called close packing circles. Anyone heard of close packing circles? They're, they're, they're groups, triangular groups of touching circles. And the reason they're important structurally is the triangulation you get from close packing circles. Now here's, in my opinion, was a geometry 
using closed packing circles. This guy, whoever invented that window and designed it, in my head, was using these circles, organizing space that way. It's cool. I mean, it's cool. However you look at it, I mean, he lived so many years ago, what, six, seven hundred years ago, but still a good idea. And on the right, you can just see, if you can see, how those circles apply to the window. 